Uh, if you have some minutes, uh, go and have a look at the video link that I've set above, which is to a video that I recorded uh, about a few days after I left Suhas Ralkar. Uh, I think that was March the 3rd, 2017. And what I had done, I had gone down to um, Thiruvananthapuram, which is where I had lived when I was uh, living in India and uh, had a business there for all, the best part of a decade. And for the first two years I was there, I was living just two kilometers from the Lord Padamashwami Temple. And uh, I think that means Lotus Temple, and it has a, a uh, bath, a water tank there uh, to, to the north of the temple. Uh, as far as I know, the temple faces east-west, and it has seven lightning conductors on the top. Okay? And uh, the big rage when I was there was in, I think, 2012. They found uh, this 22 billion worth of gold and jewels. And that, that was the weight of the gold at that time when gold was worth a lot less now than now. And the jewels. And uh, the artifact value, they said, would be at least 200 billion. And um, that was in the vaults that they had looked at. But there was a vault B... Um, and uh, at some point I will talk about Vault B. But in late 2016, early 2017, I had started to realise that Ken Shoulders uh, was quite an important uh, character uh, and his understanding uh, of what Lena was um, had come from his research into the work of John Hutchison. And... I had come come to a realization, and I, in January, I think it was, or, or uh, yeah, no, uh, I think the second week in February, I was in California. Uh, I was ready to do a uh, glow stick 5.4 uh, with Alan Goldwater, the wonderful uh, 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 scientist that uh, I have the pleasure to work with there, and. Um, we were invited to speak by Carl Page, that's the Larry Page, the, the brother of Larry Page, who found, was one of the founders of Google, at the Stanford uh, um, Energy Club and to give an update of you know, where things were. And my role was to give an update of things in Europe. And uh, I introduced for the first time, really, um, my sort of burgeoning um, idea that... that uh, uh, Ball Lightning had a massive role to play in Lena, if not the role. And I talked about this and how this is a natural phenomenon. And uh, at that time, just before I went into that presentation, I was there with Brian Alberston and, and I was there with Alan Goldwater. And, and I said, I think I've figured this out. Um, and I think, I think Ken Shoulders has, has got it. And, uh, and you just have to create these exotic vacuum objects and, and manipulate them and uh, they'll do the job, but they'll do way, way, way more than that. Um, well, that kind of snowballed and uh, by the time I recorded this video here, if I zoom in, um, in front of the Padmaswami Temple uh, in Thiruvananthapuram, uh, I'd had a bit of an epiphany and uh, I went down to talk some of my to my some of my friends in um, uh, Trivandrum, and one of them was uh, very good friends with the uh, senior religious clerics at the uh, temple there. And I was talking about the technology, and I asked him some specific questions. And you know, I asked him about the what's the importance of the, the swastika, what, the makeba, um, these kind of things. And, and, and he was telling me that the swastika is everywhere in, in um, uh, Indian temples. And he, he also said that the makeba, um, that's in all our temples as well. And he said that according to the Hindu religion, the makeba is uh, um, the source of everything. 
everything comes um, from um, the Makeba. So this is very interesting because it's also in, in the Jew Jewish religion. But um, I, I then started talking about uh, the, the temple vaults. And this is going to be relevant when we come to looking at uh, the megalithic site that I first became aware of this time last night. <laughs> um, having watched my first ever Ancient Aliens. So that was quite funny. Uh, anyway, so it was just, uh, I think... I think it's uh, series 15, episode one. There we go. So if you haven't seen it, I've given a link to basically the script uh, in Czech, but uh, uh, someone, you can translate it using Google Translate. But anyway, um, I, I was talking about the, the uh, gold in the vaults and, and so forth, and the fact that there's, there's apparently this curse and the fact that the temple gold or treasures is all owned by this god. It's not owned by the state and it's not owned by the, the former king of Travancore, which is the one third of Tre uh, Trevandrum. And uh, uh, he said, well, I know, I know, you know, there's some weird things that, that went on. Um, and what happened was, is when, when they went into this temple vault where there's like piles of treasure, um, they wanted to record the position of everything. Uh, with laser range finding, what happened is the government put a budget together of uh, five million, and they they built an army base in the ground area of this temple. And it's funny because when I first visited this temple, there was two two guys with a dhoti. And what a dhoti is is basically like a big tea towel, and they have nothing on, nothing on here. And these were the guys that were guarding the biggest treasure hoard on planet Earth when I first went and lived next to it. But in 2012, this that they got the permission to. Uh, go and look at this, and um, uh, the the government set up this fund of five million, and they they asked them to go into uh, and record all the position. And what what it was there's a space center that's about uh, I guess about twelve thirteen kilometers up the road, um, and the space center was entrusted by doing three D volumetric scans of these treasures, so that if anyone tried to replace them with a fake, they would know in the future and you know, there was all this, shall we make the biggest university in the world? And because and, they could put in a huge dowry by just leveraging some of the, the, the worth of this treasury. And it was, it was just the news for 2012, basically. Um, and he said, but when they went down into the, the vaults, uh, the laser range finders, the cameras, the video cameras, absolutely everything that they had with them stopped working. So they thought, well, that's odd. And so they went out of the temple, uh, sorry, out of the temple vault, and um, everything started working again. So they went back in the vault, and nothing worked. Absolutely, basically, every anything that had a transistor in it did not work. Okay, uh, you could go in there, and you could be in there, and that was absolutely fine. You could work in there, but things that were technological could not work in there. And uh, this is interesting because I was speaking later. Um, to uh, Dr. George Eagley, uh, who I'd learnt, had my first initiation with the, the history of uh, sites of, of uh, natural ball lightning. And he had actually done a study where he went to Israel and he uh, was studying the spoon benders in Israel. Now, it isn't just one guy uh, that learned how to do spoon bending. There, there apparently were these teenagers, and it tended to be young boys, who were able to bend metal. Um, and so, anyway, he tried to film these people, but could never film, get close enough, you know, with his cat. The cameras failed. And uh, this will come into the story later down the line. But back to the temple. He said, the way they fixed, the way they fixed them not being able to see uh, uh, and use their electronic equipment in the, the temple vault was they saw this metal band. It was a ring band that went round the temple vault. And what they did was they cut this metal band and then all of their equipment started working. Given the fact that it has seven large metal lightning conductors on the top and there's a, there's a metal coil effectively uh, in the bottom of this, um, it is uh, really weird to me that this electronic equipment would not work. Um, uh, it's got to be telling us something. And 
my thinking was, if there were these gods that this treasure was being put into in order to seek favour from the gods, and in fact, you know, this is what my staff would do. They would take a loan. They would earn all the money they can. They could sell things and whatever. They would get money and they would donate it to the temple. And you had like a price list. You could get these favours from the god or the gods. And it, there must be some truth into why that is. It can't just be a scam. But they were, the, the, the uh, Karaite people were trading with ancient Rome, with Arabia, with China, and there are, we know this because there are treasures in there from those regions spanning back through to the Roman era. So you have a temple that's built a couple of thousand years ago, and there's been a temple there for a lot longer. It was the tallest structure basically in Kerala for a very, very long time, definitely in tr uh, Trivandrum, and it had a technology in that vault that was able to prevent all modern cameras, phones, laser rangefinders from working. So you imagine I'd gone from predicting X, Y, and Z in Lena, seeing that Suhas Raulkar, seeing the technology real, going down, speaking about it to my friend who's got uh, uh, very good connections with the temple, and he tells me this. Anyway, I'm going to get on to the, the main point here, uh, which is uh, the explanation of uh, this temple. And let me see if I can find an image here. So this is uh, the p p position in um, the Pacific where you have Nan Madal, uh, Madol, Nan Madol. I'm probably going to get this wrong. I only found out about it 24 hours ago. Okay. So you have Australia down here, you have the Philippines up here, Japan, China, Vietnam, and so forth. Over here on the, the right-hand side, you have uh, Hawaii, uh, and this is Nan Madol. So if we zoom into this, uh, one thing that's interesting to me is uh, this little feature up here. And you're saying, what's that feature? Well, that feature there, if I zoom in a little bit more, and go up there is Ena Witak Atoll. This is for me one of the most important sites on earth right now and it's my, for the last two years it's been a passion of mine to try and find a solution to fix the uh, dome there which has all of the nuclear waste from the Pacific Island testing of the US and it's at risk of contaminating the sea with really nasty radionuclides. And so, other than Fukushima, it's probably the biggest risk to the biggest ocean on Earth. But anyway, that is a 250 kilometers or so away from this island over here called, uh, uh, let me get that there. It's uh, in, in Micronesia, and it's called Pompeii. Not the place where the volcano in Italy killed people. It's P-O-H-N-P-E-I. And on the right-hand side of that uh, is this smaller island called Temwen Island. And on the right-hand side of that is this... Um, construction here called Nan Madal, uh, Madol, okay? And as far as I know, the story is behind this, that uh, um, it is made of prismatic basalt. And you're probably asking, what is prismatic basalt? Well, um, there is some images here. I think if I go to this translated site, where is it? Oh, dear. Terrible. This is me trying to find out how to translate things. That's the website. <laughs> okay, so um, this is the island here. This is Nan Madol, uh, and you've got mangroves and stuff around it. And it's a very large area. And in fact, I've got a couple of stats uh, for you. Uh, let me get those up. So uh, essentially, it is uh, two and a half thousand miles or three and a half thousand kilometers or something like that northeast of Australia. And there's a megalithic city there, uh, this called the uh, Nan Madol. And it's 11 ma square mile complex and it's built into the ocean using 250 million tons of prismatic basalt. And some of the blocks uh, weigh over uh, 50 tons. 
Yeah. Um, so uh, there's a couple of things that, that really stood out. Uh, and this particular article you're looking at here is a translation uh, of the episode uh, from Ancient Aliens, Series 15, 1. And if we go through it, um, yes, a lot of basalt. So here, here's a model of what they thought this structure looked like. If I can get and zoom into that. You can go and have a look at this in your in your own time. So, but it wasn't wasn't just the sort of Venice of the East uh, as they called it. Um, it is that the whole island, the Tanwin Island or whatever it's called, next door, it is structured and uh, built in such a way uh, that it would channel water to the 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 bit out at sea, but also they could do farming and stuff. So it's, it's an absolutely massive complex. And so if you go through, this apparently is the people that, that, that were meant to have built it. Uh, uh, they tried a, a number of years ago to see if they could get a one ton piece of this basalt uh, uh, and move it around in the ocean using the claimed method of putting it on bamboo rafts. And they, they completely failed. In fact, they couldn't find a way to ship it there, even, even a one ton piece. And some of these ton pieces are 50 tons. So that's, that's Tenwin Island. Uh, these are some uh, structures in there. Uh, this is the big stone here. Um, uh, yeah, so you can see the sort of scale here. These these are the people that are in the documentary. And you can see them walking around. You can see the size of these pieces of uh, basalt. And apparently, apparently the basalt came from this... Well, what they've identified by looking at the, what's in the basalt... They've looked at the inside of the basalt and they tried to find similar basalt across the island, nearby islands. And they found that 40% of the basalt comes from this particular structure. Um, uh, it's called... Uh, um, where is it? Anyway, it's, it, it, it's basically the top... Or I think it's several hundred metres high. The stats are in, in the video here. Whoa, dear. The stats are in this. It's 122 meters high above sea level, uh, and it's 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 the the wrong wrong way round. But it says 60 percent here. But anyway, uh, around about half, let's say, of the um, uh, structure came from this. But the interesting thing is, it wasn't mined from around the base. It was taken off the top. It was taken off the top. Okay. Now, in the documentary, they are saying that the legend is that there were these huge giant birds and they would lift up these uh, pieces of basalt, uh, these long, prismatic, extremely heavy ba basalt off the top of this mountain and fly it down the 25 miles, whatever it is, to uh, the place where they were constructing uh, this uh, place. Now... The idea of having massive birds being trained to do this is a little bit laughable. And, and who's, who's going to be mining on this very steep? I mean, this, if you go and look at the, the shape of this uh, Puesen Malek, I'm sorry, I'm just going to make a, a complete pig's ear of how to say this, but it's P-W-I-S-E-H-N Malek. It's literally like a volcanic plug like that. And, and the, the base is not taken. The top is basically they've taken some prime bits, long, long prismatic columns, off the top and here's here's another view of it you can see it's all covered in, in jungle now at one point in the uh, presentation they go to this quarry now this isn't the quality of basalt or the scale as you can see it's, this is more like uh, when I shared um, a picture I took I think about oh god 31 years ago at the Giants Causeway earlier in the year I think in in March of uh, basalt but it w was only short uh, like chunks uh, not these huge long prisms that you're seeing here but that are much bigger that the the, the megalithic structure was built from um, and they're coming in here and there's a discussion between the experts on the island and the American expert that's been trying to explain this for the last 30 years and they're talking about how they they had to have known which rock to get and how to chisel it out and be able to lift it and it would have required cranes or all kinds of uh, things um and so um there's there's that 
Um, and then what they go on to say is that the thinking is it's, it's of the order of like a couple of thousand years old or whatever, but that they think that there is a whole much bigger city that it was built on top of that is actually under the ocean. And they are saying that it's covered with corals and that it's uh, 24 meters below the ocean and that knowing the sea level rises after the last ice age is between 12 and 20,000 years old, this ancient structure. So what they did in this uh, program is that they, and I couldn't believe this when I was seeing it. I mean, it was like, really? <laughs> what they did was is they, they had these underwater drones and they were wired. You know, they weren't like drones that were completely remote control. They were remote control via a long wire. Uh, and so they were like little submersibles. And they had tested them the previous day. Uh, and they came to uh, uh, this, the end of the island where uh, the megalithic site is. And they put them in the water and got near to one of these ancient walls that is under the water. And you can see live on the video that the the uh, video feed starts mashing up and then it just freezes. So they go, oh, okay, um, well, okay, we've got a spare, let's put that in. So they put the spare in, it goes up, gets to the same kind of area um, around the um, uh, megalithic structure. And they suddenly have exactly the same thing happen. Both of these devices are basically good as new. They've been tested the day before, uh, on the north side of the island, no problem at all. They bring them down to this uh, megalithic structure uh, under the water and they fail. Now in the documentary they talk about um, that maybe there's some sort of technology that was used by whoever really did construct this that uh, left the basalt, which can be magne magnetic and so therefore can be magnetized, with a magnetic uh, um, uh, field effect left over it left it magnetic and this is this is interesting to me because uh, we have found even in our Chalani wire that we had a change in magnetism uh, of the copper nickel that we had in in our wire but also John Hutchison found that even non-magnetic materials became magnetic and if you recall in my my presentation that I gave two days ago I would expect that the tungsten uh, that was in the Vega reactor uh, of Henk, where the plasmoid was encapsulating it, I, I would expect that that bit would have some magnetic anomalies. But more interestingly is that this looks like the same kind of effect but in, imbued onto a structure that uh, um, uh, has has lasted for a very long time and the thing that i know uh, it's not necessarily just magnetics in my view exotic vacuum objects can stay as shoulder said indefinitely in materials uh, particularly metals and there is metals in mag magnetite or so, sorry um basalt uh, and so um or it's it's quartz but anyway it, it, it can be influenced in such a way that um, this this uh, field, this coherent matter, stays in there. Now, uh, uh, I just I just want to talk about how I think um, this was done, and to do that, I'm going to switch to uh, this shot, um, and this is a video that you may be aware of uh, from John Hutchison uh, uh, of the Hutchison effect, and. Uh, if you look at here, we have several things going on, and in my view, they are magnetic related, but they're also exotic vacuum object related, and shoulders would say that's the case, and so forth. So you have, uh, I'm just going to play it here. Um, so you've got this aluminium, and it's a, a kind of jelly, jellyfied effect going on here. It's, it's moving around and jigging around and changing its physical dimensions. Now, remember what I said in my last presentation. Exotic vacuum objects uh, can be formed out of something that is the same atom at the same temperature and it is in phase. 
Okay. Now, you can either make something in the environment uh, a coherent matter, or you can make the object itself a coherent matter. And aluminium is almost perfect for this. And John Hutchison used aluminium a lot. So I've got two samples here uh, from John Hutchison, the, the fracture sample and uh, the coral twist. And uh, aluminium has some really wonderful properties that this technology uh, interacts with in a, in a good way. The, probably the most important is that aluminium is a single isotope. I'll say that again. Aluminium is a single isotope like sodium-23 or protium, okay? Or not, not an isotope, but an electron. So if you're going to make a coherent matter wave out of something, it's a very good material. Secondly, it is the fourth most conductive element, which means its electrons are very free to move. So getting them to persist, persist in a, a coherent matter state is going to be easier because uh, uh, you can grab them. Thirdly, it's highly conductive. Both, uh, sorry, highly conductive in the thermal sense, which means it can readily get to thermal equilibrium through its bulk. Okay, and John Hutchison would often put his samples on a piece of wood, so that's not conducting the heat away. It's a good insulator. Um, it's an insulator both electrically and an insulator uh, um, from a, from a thermal point of view. So this would be the good way to try and get your uh, a, a, a coherent matter state. Now, in the case of this object, the fracture, what's very important about the fracture is that uh, it looks like a piece of wood. In fact, we've got several pieces of Hutchison effect material um, that look like pieces of wood. And they're definitely not pieces of wood, but they end up looking like a piece of wood. And the reason is, is that in this case, is, it's, it's kind of like drawn aluminium or extruded aluminium um, billet. And that, that gives you long crystal grains. And remember what Ken Childers said, is that exotic vacuum objects like to uh, uh, migrate uh, or don't like impedance changes. So in this case, you have, uh, this is effectively the same as the top of that um, uh, basalt uh, uh, outcrop that they mined this material from, with our long crystal grains going up like this. And the exotic vacuum objects will build up uh, on the uh, crystal interfaces between these. And then they will do exactly what was observed by uh, Takaaki Matsumoto in 1991. So if I can find it again. Uh, this is his uh, book in Japanese. Not that I read Japanese, but uh, it's, it's fine for showing you this. Um, and so what happens is, is, if you go and look at the presentation I made before Christmas uh, called Co Coherent Matter Waves, and that is based on a patent that was awarded to Lockheed Martin. And Lockheed Martin, on the 28th of December, announced that they are going to be outfitting the next generation of Japanese uh, fighter planes with, they call them microwave weapons, but they're, in my opinion, they're, they're coherent matter uh, uh, weapons. And the Russians are doing that. And the Americans are doing that. They announced that in 2017. Anyway, so here, here we have this palladium here which was um, uh, in a palladium deuterium experiment and then they cut it in half and they found these features inside the palladium and if you look at the features inside the palladium what's happened is uh, it's come to the crystal boundaries here and it started to eat away at the crystal boundaries okay and he actually sketches uh, the process, uh, having done however many experiments it is. Now, so you, you get these little uh, coherent uh, balls uh, appearing on the crystal boundaries here in our palladium. They kind of chew it out until they start disintegrating the actual material. But if we are wanting to build a megalithic structure and we have this technology, we have something that is using this technology to float in the air, like, uh, sorry, did you miss all that? No, you, you saw me on the little camera. Um, uh, here, we go to here, 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 here. So, what, 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 you, what you can think about this as is you're going to the basalt, 
and you are you've got your vehicle that flies in the air it probably almost certainly and definitely uses this technology uh, and then it fires a co coherent matter wave beam down onto your basalt your basalt is magnetic okay and uh, uh, it can easily find the, the, the boundaries between the uh, um, prismatic columns, okay? And it'll go all the way down until it gets to the bottom of the pr prismatic column. And then by energizing it, you will encapsulate the entire column. If it's lodged in there a bit, you just an energize it a little bit more. And just like you saw, saw in the practical experiments of Takaaki Matsumoto from 91 and 92, uh, it will eat away what it needs to eat away until, you know, you can keep going up until you see the, the columns coming up with you. Okay? And they come up. Now, um, you can then transport them because basically whatever's in that uh, coherent matter, uh, this ball lightning sheath, uh, weighs nothing. It just weighs nothing. And what you are seeing here on this John Hutchison, in my opinion, is... He is creating at room temperature, which is exactly what is in the Salvatore Pi uh, 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 um, US Navy patterns. And it's exactly what is in the Lockheed Martin that you can create uh, co uh, uh, superconducting material effectively at, at um, uh, room temperature. Now, you, uh, you know you can create coherent matter at uh, uh, zero Kelvin. That's m how most people do bose einstein condensates. And we, we know that John Hutchison was effectively doing it at uh, room temperature and whatever temperature it was on the particular day that he was doing it. And, um, and I believe that we have demonstrated in the work that we showed the other day that we are producing coherent matter in these plasmoids. Uh, and so, uh, and I, I will probably go back to the video of that in a minute, um, but back to here. Um, and so what you're doing is you are effectively encapsulating this ball with coherent matter. It doesn't matter that you can't see it. It doesn't matter. It's just there. Now, they would move these things across the island and bring them down. And then, um, you know, they, they would use a different technology uh, to uh, place them. Actually, it's the same technology. <laughs> but just a handheld device. And it, it will be extremely simple. And I think what I need to do at this point is to get up the video of that I showed you the other day. Um, and is it here? So I'm gonna, I'm gonna switch to this frame just to fill in the gap. So remember everything that's inside your uh, coherent matter sheath is going to not be affected by gravity. And you can see on the top right hand corner of the this uh, GIF here, that when the plasmoids come together, they wet together. And that was described in fusion technology in this paper in 2001. And we talked about that in the previous uh, presentation. And if you get a lot of them coming together, it starts to make a continuous thing around it. And if you see in the middle here, uh, it's probably not the best example, here, you can see that they're coming together here, but over here you get a continuous sheath going all the way around. And you will have seen in other uh, Vega experiments how the entire ball gets covered with this. And what I'm saying is these structures are of different shapes. Okay, these, th this one is a, a, a long and thin and coily and it's, it's covering it and here it's spirally and we've shown spheres and we've shown uh, blocks. And if you get it right, it will cover the, the thing. And I believe that that becomes weightless. And I explained the uh, ball lightning anecdotes uh, from Dr. George Eagley from his research in the 1970s and 80s, uh, how that can come about. And so what I want to do now is I'm going to flick you back to uh, here once I find something. I'll play that from the beginning so you can just watch it through and I will find something else for you. If you've got any questions, throw them into the uh, chat. Um, 
Whilst I'm doing this, I'm just going to say that, you know, when I was saying that the machine machinery did not work when it approached the wall, the two underwater drones, that is exactly what I believe uh, um, was being described from the Padamashwami temple when the uh, uh, scientists went in there to document everything. And I think it's the same thing that was uh, um, being observed uh, by Dr. George Eagley when he was looking at the spoon benders uh, in um, I think it was in the 1970s or 60s or something. It was 70s, probably. Um, anyway. Um, I think he said that, I think it was in 1982, that he was invited to Brookhaven National Laboratory in America by Bernie Haish, I think it is, which is a colleague of Hal Puthoff, <laughs> um, because of his studies, either of the ball lightning studies or of his studies of the spoon benders because it was a colleague of Hal Puthoff, I think uh, Andre Petrov or something like that, he uh, arranged for um, Yuri Geller to come over and work on the Psychic Spy program. So you can see how all these things are kind of kind of connected. <laughs> uh, yeah. Right. Let me see if I can find this video. Okay, I'm going to risk bringing this up in pre Premiere. <laughs> I haven't talked about the Philadelphia experiment. Perhaps I will at some point. Any more questions whilst I'm just getting what I want to show you here in Adobe Premiere? Uh, the Hutchison effect is the same effect as this. Uh, it is ancient technology. It is not new. I can tell you, having had to have this in my head since the beginning of 2017, has, has been really been difficult to have to deal with <laughs> but I can tell you it's nice to start getting this stuff off my chest uh, the there's two ways you can approach it so uh, there's a question here is the aluminium turned into coherent matter uh, by John Hutchison is he using the AB effect okay yes yes very good that is Andrea Puchak uh, who I was talking about earlier so I'm gonna go to uh, a full frame here um, okay so there's two two methods here. In, in this one, the the exotic vacuum objects have come to the crystal boundaries, and they did move them around. Uh, and there's other samples that we have where pieces have become magnetic and they've rotated around and they bound on because there's if you get these structures big enough, they produce pseudo monopoles and then they reorient themselves. And that's kind of what's going on here. You've probably got a couple of magnets that uh, pseudo monopoles that have been built up out of the the coherent uh, uh, matter and arrangements and, and then, then they're moving around but the actual because this is a smooth twist the electron lattice bonds have lost their normal lattice attachment to the other 27 aluminium and that that has um, caused it to uh, uh, go into this kind of not liquid state uh, jelly like state um, so this is more fracturing on the crystal boundaries. So this is more an example of how how these megalithic structures. So um, I, I'm probably going to I'm going to try and dig them out. I, I did take a copy of them earlier, but I have I think four slides from O'Day, which is a presentation that I authored at the end of 2017, beginning of 2018, which I want to interject here. But um, I took a sample here uh, uh, off the end of the coral sample here uh, when I was in. Um, uh, Russia in October uh, uh, at the Bull Lightning and uh, Cold Nuclear Transmutation Conference in, in Sochi. And uh, they said that they were going to test this at the Royal Academy of Science. But the, the thing that I, that, they haven't given me the data there, yeah, that's par for the course. But anyway, um, what I will say is that if I drop this, I will ask you, does this sound like aluminium? Ow, just made a hole in my computer. <laughs> Well, 
<laughs> that does not sound to me like aluminium. It should sound much more dud, okay? And <laughs> this took me an extremely long time with a hacksaw to cut. This is not, this is not your average aluminium. And I've already shared some analysis on the surface. But when we looked with an XRF at the end of this, it was reading technetium, it was reading all kinds of things, but it wasn't reading all the spectral lines. This is not aluminium anymore. It's, it, it's not any element in the middle here, okay? Yeah, way too high pitch. Now, this is very interesting. And, and remind me about what I've just said here. I've, I've got 15, 14, 16 minutes before curfew. Okay, God, I, this is really annoying. Um, because this isn't the only thing that will have high pitch. Um, uh, I, so I just want to talk about something that I showed you yesterday. So I'm, I'm going to bring in um, this source here. Uh, can I get it here? Uh, desktop uh, app window oh Adobe Premiere okay uh, and then okay so I'm gonna go back and show you this video here because there's something very important in here that I discussed briefly in the last presentation okay so Firstly, we have our plasmoid cutting on the right-hand side. So it actually cut here. It did not cut on this side, it cut here. That's where it's hinging from. And as it moves over to the right, it gets spun round as it gets caught in the plasma, kind of like the, the, the semi-coherent area around it. It gets grabbed and then thrown over to the side. Okay? That's one. Now I want to go to the next one, which is the second cut here and it gets the resonance on the other side in a second ready ready boom 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 and it gets cut again boom now in this case and go back to just as it's cut it flies underneath it's falling under gravity falling under gravity and then there is an interaction between the two plasmoids and it magnetically aligns them boom boom now the whole structure is oriented just by the plasmoid. The plasmoid is orienting that whole piece of tungsten, one of the heaviest metals there are. Goes over there, boom. That magnetic mag magnetism on that is reorienting that large piece of tungsten relative to the plasmoid. So we go over to it again. Ready, 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 ready. It's coming up, it's coming up, getting to resonance, getting to resonance, boom, 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 cut. And it goes over here, gets caught, plasmoids interact, moves over, and it flips round, and then the gravity is just too much for it, and it drops back down and, and then settles on the base. What I'm saying there is that if you had something that was treated like this, like this, Remember what Ken Shoulders said, the exotic vacuum objects are in here indefinitely, right? This is forever changed. This is a special, unique piece of metal, okay? This is not like your, your mum and dad's aluminium, okay? And if I had something that was treated with the same technology over here, which is the other piece of the uh, 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 plasmoid you just saw, the, with the same coherent type of matter, in that case, it's made of electrons and, and protons. Um, then if I came along with this, which has not been used for a long time, and came over to here, it would re-excite it. How do I know it can re-excite it? Because, I tell you, because um, in the Lion Reactor series, he was able to reactivate and produce strange radiation tracks from uh, a, the copper oxide by heating it up to 800 or 1000 degrees for eight hours and then putting it back to some x-ray uh, plates. And then when I was speaking to Baranoff and Zetalepin in Sochi, they said, oh, well, <laughs> nine months, that's nothing. We, we've done it for like uh, 18 months with a, with a piece of their material that they had treated and found strange radiation tracks from. And so 
Shoulders is saying it's in here indefinitely. So if I made a piece of material that had coherent matter in it, and it's dormant, and then I had some live coherent matter on, and, and I've got it here, this is my piece of basalt, and I've got my coherent matter sheath here, and I've, I've pulled it off the top of my mountain, like this, and I, I'm down on the ground, and I've got my material over here, and the, 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 the landing craft, or whatever it is, the quarry craft, comes down, and I come along, and I, I hold it in my hand. Hold it in my hand. I don't get a spark from it, so I have a nice big end on this end, and I have a pointy end on that end. And I just want to get the tip interacting with that plasma, just like you saw in that video that I shared two days ago. And then I can manipulate that around because it kind of phase locks itself. Like that. Just like you saw, the plasmoid gets locked and controls the massive piece of material hanging off it. Okay? But in our case, we've got a plasmoid that's covering our whole piece of basalt. So once we're locked, we can rotate. In, in fact, if we had one in both hands, you could grab it and you could orient it. It would weigh about the weight of one electron. Okay? It would physically be there. You could see it, but you could move it around with two pointy things. You, you could move it around, orient it like that, carry it around, move it around, move it around. We'll, we'll put it over there. Over there, that's nice. Oh no, I just want it shifted a little bit. That, that's fine, great. And you know what? All you need to do then is hose it down with some water <laughs> to, to kind of settle it in or ground it. These things will go to ground. These will go to ground. And uh, or, or if you put water on it, you can decontaminate it from the outside, okay? Uh, in the case of the Russian melting technology, they used to uh, um, uh, take aluminium, use scalar uh, uh, energy on it with, with uh, static electricity. And then they were able to um, uh, manipulate it uh, into a mold and then they would let it drain. They would let it drain. So basically, you would probably want to do these on dry days. If I was going to be building uh, whatever this place is called, I've forgotten already. <laughs> <laughs> like I say, I only found out about it yesterday. Um, it is called uh, Nan Madol, World Heritage Site. So uh, uh, I would have the thing, picking them up, moving them over. They're quite energized and I'd move them in, into place. Now, the interesting thing is that if I show you... Um, uh, where are we? Evos like to go to ground. That's basically what they do. Um, uh, Dan, I really don't want to split this presentation and, and, and come back to it tomorrow because I've got it all in my head now. <laughs> um, uh, let me see. Okay, all right. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you this. I'll get it over here. Okay, so I'm going to switch back to... Uh, dang, I have got so much to show you to just really... Uh, O'Day will continue, Corky. I'm just scratching the surface. <laughs> I'm gonna. I'm, before I go, I'll try, I'll try and pull up those at least one or two of those slides um, because they're so critical to what I'm what I'm getting across to you. Um, okay, so I'm going to switch back here. So what what I what I'm going to show you here is StoneCircleTours.co.za museum, and this is Michael Zellinger. And Mo, Mo, Michael Zellinger uh, uh, has found these tools. And they tend to be, he, here's a, a typical one of these tool sets. And there's the spiky tool. And there is the, rather the cone shaped tool. And these torus. Now, the torus uh, is interesting. I'll come to that. But the spiky tool is what I would suggest you held in your hands. 
Okay. Now we all know with uh, high frequency uh, um, electricity uh, from Tesla coils, you can you can grab the Tesla coil and you can grab a, a, a light bulb over here, and the power will go through your body. So. What, what you're doing is you're having an anti-gravity thing, like a ball lightning. It's floating in the air. It's floating in the air. So th this is our piece of basalt, and it's floating in the air. Like a ball lightning, it doesn't really necessarily want to go to ground. If it goes to ground, it'll kind of lose its charge, and it'll be stuck there. But let's say we've got it here, uh, and it's floating in the air. And I come along with my preconditioned piece of material, like this Hutchison material, and I come along to it, and I can grab it. And it wants to attach to me because the exotic vacuum objects, some of them, are discharging through my body to ground. Okay? And that's why you have a spiky thing. Okay? And two of them allows you to manipulate it. One doesn't really, it's not very good. You can, you can move around like that. You put it over your head or whatever. But two allows you to rotate it in, in any axis you like. So you have to have two. Okay? And the thing is, if you, if you listen to Michael Tellinger, he says that these stones sound very high frequency when you drop them. Oh, that's interesting. And he, he says that the Taurus here, uh, he took one on a plane and it disabled all of the equipment in, uh, I think it was Dubai. He kind of walked through with it in his bag and they said, what's that? Oh, it's a stone. But uh, they then came onto the plane and said, um, you know, what's going on? Because basically all of the servers and the equipment in the place went down. Okay, I, I think, and th this is just a speculation I have like right now, that the, 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 the Taurus is basically, it, it's like, it's a lifting device. It's kind of like a halfway house. These things charged up, they are treated, they're treated. And by then re-energizing the exotic vacuum objects that are in there, you can then use those to lift things. And how do you lift them? Well, you put a rope, you put a rope through the hole. And because the rope, let's in in Africa they make uh, ropes of sisal, which is kind of like a, it looks like a bit like an aloe vera plant, but it's more spiky, and it, and it's basically, um, it's basically uh, cellulose. And we already know that cellulose really doesn't get affected by this technology, okay? And so um, uh, you can you could put a couple of these around, energize them, they're up in the air, and then you could move anything of any weight whatsoever. <laughs> whatsoever <laughs> as long as your, your ropes don't give way okay so the, the, it, there's two ways to do it one you have a, a fancy craft that comes along and it does your energizing and pulls it out now i will show you these slides from uh, oday if i can get them up because uh i think they are really really rather special okay um so let me see if i can do it here can i get add images let's do that Please ask any questions. And what I might do is if you go to the remoteview.icu and you ask any questions there, there's so much more I want to go through to just explain this. Um, but I think you'll get the, the, the basics of this. Um, yes, uh, re replay uh, is available on this, so you can go over it again later. So. Nan Madal. Okay, so this is slide 26 from O'Day, and this is from late 2017. So, in the Sun newspaper, New York, from 1911, 1911, Tesla promises big things. And he's asked by the interviewer, how about aerial navigation? Dr. Tesla was asked. He considered for a moment or two, and then replied with great deliberation. The application of this principle will give the world a flying machine unlike anything that has ever been suggested before. It will have no planes, no screw propellers or devices of any kind hitherto used. It will be small and compact, excessively swift and above all, perfectly safe in the greatest storm. It can be built of any size and can carry any weight that may be desired. That is Tesla laying it out in public in 1911, three years before he uh, got his patent for the Wardenclyffe Tower. Now, 
I'm going to show you the next slide of interest from O'Day. So that was slide 26. I'm going to slide, show you slide 80. Now, before I show you slide 80, I want you to know that uh, if, I can, if my tablet is charged up here, there was something that I presented uh, that I had, I think it was this day uh, on 2018. So it's precisely two years ago. And um, it was the structure that I believed uh, was fundamental. And this is one of my remote viewings. I, I did not come up with this, um, or I, I wanted to know the, the, the truth, but uh, uh, it just came to me when I was trying to sleep. Um, so I'm, I'm just waiting for my tablet to boot up here. Um, so maybe I'll show you sli uh, uh, slide 89. Okay, so I'm going to show you slide 89. Why not? Is it going to give me slide 89? No. Uh, oh, it's putting it in the wrong window. Okay, let's try that again. Images. Slide 89. Here we have slide 89. Construction. This, this was in O'Day at uh, the beginning of 2018. And it's slide 89, construction. No environmental issues with steel synthesis and concrete production. You can just do it. Because you can produce all the energy you like. So you don't have to worry about those things in the future. No difficulty lifting large pieces into place. Liquefaction on and moulding of structures. Particle beam cutting. Floating bridges. And no needs for tunnels. So... Uh, I've already explained the no difficulty for lifting large pieces into place. The top one is re with regard to energy. Li liquefaction of moulding of structures, that's what you're do doing here. Silicon is a semi-metal, uh, oxygen. Uh, I've already shown you that in the Lion reactors, uh, you can bore holes and, 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 and uh, interact with uh, quartz. Um, in Moscow in 2015, on February the early February 2nd or something, February, whenever I was there visiting Parkamov the first time, uh, I was in the plasma lab, the Joint, Joint Plasma Institute lab in North Moscow, and they showed me, a, and they said, what's going on here, because we don't know, and they had Parkamov nickel and hydrogen in this uh, uh, ceramic tube, I believe it was my light, but it might have been alumina, but I think it was my light, because he was using a lot of my light at that time. And he, they put a, they'd run an experiment, but then it started to leak. And they put a hydrogen hose on the end and sealed it. And they, they, they turned on the hydrogen gas and lit it. And there were these minute jets coming out of the, 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 um, the tube. And uh, they said, this has got loads of little perforations in it. And I didn't know about shoulders at the time. But now I know that that malite tube had had co coherent mar matter boring through. And I will tell you, and I will share with you, that when I looked at, in 2018, uh, um, uh, some of the inside material out of Lion 1, or Lion 2, I think it was, there are also these bore channels that have been made. And also, um, uh, uh, it's in the alumina. And also, you have uh, bore channels that, that uh, Ken Shoulders found in, uh, in um, uh, alumina ceramics. And the reality is that any uh, uh, ionic uh, ceramic, however high temperature it is, it doesn't matter whether it's zirconia or, or alumina or whatever, if it's ionic, then uh, if you go back to Nernst, he made these things called the Nernst Lab and so around, around 1898, 1903 or something like that, between there, when they were trying to make better light bulbs before before Langmuir came along. And he found that if you heated up these, these ceramics, like zirconia or alumina or whatever, uh, that um, they became a conductor over about 1,000 degrees. We rediscovered this after doing our glow stick experiments. But basically, uh, it becomes a conductor, which means you've got free electrons, which means an Evo can bore a hole through it. So, you know, th th there's really nothing that you can't interact with with exotic vacuum objects just beyond a certain thre threshold. But if it's not a conductor, um, you know, if your, your coherent matter uh, uh, isn't at a, a, a temperature where, or, or isn't able to influence the temperature of the material because it's not a conductor and it's not excited too much, like it's a piece of rope going through one of those uh, tori, um, then uh, you can use rope, you can use paper, paper will survive influence of this. And, and in fact, I would go to say, and this is just my own personal thought, 
that we are a spiritual container that's able to use this technology because we're made of the elements that this technology likes to make if it starts with anything else, whether it's lighter or heavier. And uh, uh, we're, we're not a very good conductor, but we're good enough to grab two pine cones uh, of, of stone and manipulate the thing. Yeah, I know I should go. It's a, it's a ridiculous fine. It's, it's 100,000 crowns if they stop me outside. And I've already broken the curfew. So this is going to be interesting because I've got a few points I want to make. Um, 100,000 crowns is it's three and a half thousand dollars. So I really don't want to get stuffed right now. But anyway, so you can cut your blocks. OK, and in fact, if you had a block that didn't fit, you could just have a, a, this technology producing a coherent matter wave beam. So we know coherent matter waves exist. We know that they, they used a dielectric barrier discharge in the Lockheed Martin patent to be able to create them. What is a dielectric barrier discharge? It's a spark coming from your finger into air. It's a spark coming from a, a point source, like a piece of tungsten or a, 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 a tailor cone from, from, a, from, from a, a piece of uh, tailor cone forming a mercury or whatever, liquid metal, like, like, like was used in the death ray by Tesla. Anyway, so um, if, you, if you had... A, uh, uh, this you can and you could just move left and right as you layered your rock down you go <laughs> until it perfectly fitted done or you could turn the whole rock into turn little bits of rock take them up the mountain and put them down uh, onto um, uh, uh, into a bag and turn it to a liquid and then remove the bag or you know there's so every option the, the the things that you are seeing on this page to me are rather trivial for you to do rather trivial for you to do now um okay so I, i've got this open and i shared this in my sochi presentation i think on october the 4th or 6th uh, 2018 if it's going to come up here now so like i said um the previous presentation i was kind of introducing the keys to the kingdom but um this is another keys to the kingdom but the thing is, this is much simpler than the US Navy Salvatore Pai uh, uh, presentations would have you believe. This is actually much more simple than they would have you believe in the um, Lockheed Martin. Uh, there will always be subtleties and it could take you many lifetimes to work them out. But actually, in the end, it's really simple. <laughs> um, so, gallery. Da, 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 da. Okay. So this is the structure that I saw this time two years ago, this very day two years ago, in my dream. And it's a torus and it's spinning around and it produces this field structure and this kind of like bow tie-like effect. And uh, I've got propulsion pull in there. And it has a black hole in the kind of thing in the center, but I now know it's not really a black hole. Um, anyway, so that's a torus that's spinning around and spinning around like that. Um, and so I then want to show you I'd been discussing this with a uh, for a long while with um, Andrew Johnson, and uh, out of the blue, he rang me um, and said, "I've got something for you." <laughs> that isn't in Ed, Ed Lee Skyland's book, but on the twentieth of February two thousand eighteen, Andrew Johnson, who I had been regularly voicing my ideas to, sent a website with an image from the inside of Edward Lee Skyland's tome called a book in every home. Uh, Edward built Coral Castle, apparently with anti-gravity technology. Well, I am saying, and uh, if I'd had more time, I will have gone into the, the uh, um, yin yang. If you go and look at my um, uh, Sochi presentation uh, from October 2018, I showed that I observed around each of the branches. So it, it, basically, you, you have uh, a circle and a spot that's your ra that's your basic torus tor torus and what it the mark that it leaves on 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 structures and it the spot is basically kind of like a where it packs everything in in the core but these can scale so you have your torus here and then you have two smaller torus on the outside and i demonstrated that we observed those on other parts of the lion reactors and then you can have three and if you have four you end up with something that looks like a swastika okay but actually the swastika is also in the center of the torus as well but i'll come into that and and the evidence for that at another time as part of O'Day and as part of my blog and so forth but 
what you have, and if you look at the swastika, uh, the real one, and I think in June the 6th, 2017, uh, no, yeah, 2017, June the 6th, I, I made a presentation in ASTI, and on that slide, I, I had um, uh, a couple of, um, actually, no, it was in the beginning of my Sochi presentation, it was in the beginning, and it's, it's, it's a structure that's about 400 or 600 B, BC from northern Italy, where they have these swastikas proper, where you, ha you, ha you have the swastika, and then you have the two spots, and the two spots are your yin-yang on each of the arms. Now, you can have a this with with three you can have it with four you can have it with five and in fact i shared in my sochi presentation uh, a four star a two uh, a two star a three star a four star and a five star and in the five star where the with these elements that weren't really elements in the copper oxide on the outside of the lion crust you had yin yangs you had yin yangs and the, uh, the basic structure is effectively a yin yang as well um and in my view that's kind of what you're seeing on that tungsten wire but the point being here is that these are your two cones and they are pointing to your coherent matter contained object okay and i have found out when i was speaking to him that apparently some boys were there once when when Lee, ed lee scarlin was was uh, had a delivery of these coral big blocks of coral and they went back or something at some time uh, and they saw him with these two cone like things manipulating the rock now you also see this in, in egypt with these people holding their the cone like uh, uh things and people associated with the pineal uh, gland and that may be uh something that we can talk about at another time but uh it is i have no doubt that this rings just like michael zellinger is describing those artifacts that are all over these so-called mines and and stuff in in, in southern Africa and uh, this is not aluminium in any traditional sense uh, uh, it's been transmuted on the outside because the exotic vacuum objects do like to cluster on the outside at the impedance change um, but it's as rock solid in the center as you can imagine so uh, uh, is that all I want to say today um, uh, yeah I think it is so uh, let me see if we've got any questions uh i've heard that interaction of stage crystals natural frequencies secret for liberating h2 from h2o uh well i think a lot of people used resonance uh, uh and catalysis ca catalysis to do this and uh, I, I actually believe that it's probably very small exotic vacuum objects that are doing the job at, at that level um uh how can you tell what resonant frequency a metal sample is that well this tells me something I don't know what it is, but it definitely tells me something. <laughs> um, uh, he used like ice cream cones. Oh, right. Okay. So some, someone said that he's using like ice cream cones. So um, uh, nobody was allowed to see how he did it. Right. Sumerian god. Oh, that's what I was talking about. Yeah. Pine cones. Okay. So, so this, te this technology shows that, that Ed Lee Scallon was using it in, in, in uh, America. There were... Uh, uh, Arabia, there were Africans using it and there were Arabians using it. And I would suggest that this is how the, um, the buildings where the megalithic structure, which is uh, claimed to be basically as uh, amazing as the, the, the um, uh, uh, pyramids, I believe that this was built with this same technology. And if I could show you just, uh, I think that's basically it really. I mean, this has been, I, I just, I saw this thing last night and I go, well, I know how that works. <laughs> and so I wanted to get it out to you guys. And uh, it is the same as you are seeing with John Hutchison's work here. Um, what you are witnessing in this ball moving around like it is doing here. Uh, and these other things, these jiggling around, it's where the, the, the whole aluminium, the 27 single isotope of aluminium and the single electron types have reached the same comp temperature and he's got them in phase likely by uh, scalar waves and as i've described before scalar is where you have the same frequency but 180 degrees out of phase so it, does, it always averages a zero it's like ac but ac on top but 50 100 degrees out of phase and and so you you get that going on um and you can then because the scalar waves can go in to to the uh into the metal 
and uh, using uh, the Aronoff bond effect, you can, you can uh, uh, cause coherence. And uh, aluminium is the, probably the best thing to cohere. In the case of iron, you can, you can produce coherence on the uh, uh, surface, the electrons on the surface easier, and with ions of, say, nitrogen in the air, oxygen on the outside. And then you kind of like, uh, you can get that into the metal. And uh, I mean, you can do it basically with anything, pretty much. And it's just better if it's a metal. <laughs> um, here's jiggling around. This one, you can see the kind of magnetic interaction. It's just, it like almost moves, it, it, it teleports from one place to another, like one from one frame to another, it's just moved. Um, uh, it can move very, very quickly and, and, and basically weightless. Uh, loses its weight. And uh, you're, you're seeing liquids move there as well. And here, here is your iron going up and your big, large iron ball. Okay, so... Um, that's it. As I say, if you go to the, oh, sorry, what have we got here? Uh, yes, I had a picture of Puma Punka on there, and it's, it, it seems, you know, when I realized what this technology can do uh, at the beginning of uh, 2017, um, uh, I thought, well, this basically solves all of that. And, and, and by the end of 2017, having seen enough evidence, um, uh, to me, it, it's not that amazing, actually. Um, you could mold the, the things or you can use the, the, the coherent matter wave beams to cut things. Um, you know, so it's, it's, it's fairly trivial when you know how. Um, uh, okay, so it's incredible because we're using ridiculously silly ways to do things. <laughs> but by the way, you might not want your material to be permanently affected by it. There's a, there's a site called Great Zimbabwe, and I visited that uh, when I was 19, I think. Uh, and apparently that rock is very large rocks and, and so forth. But that rock has an encrustation on it, and it takes an extremely long time to grow. But I believe that encrustation is in part uh, there because of the way it was built. And I think it was built again with this technology. How can we use this while the world is controlled by energy corporations? Well, I can tell you that the Vega experiments, the ones that I'm uh, showing uh, it here, if I go back to this, uh, the Vega experiments here, I'm really pushing my luck with a curfew here. Oh God, <laughs> I'm gonna go in a minute. But um, the, the tungsten wire in this experiment, we do several experiments and it cost about five US dollars. Uh, it is a scrap compressed air tank. Uh, and uh, it is um, um, some microwave transformers, but you'll get everything you need to know to do that. But uh, we are really trying to work out what the risks are from strange radiation emitted from that before um, going full out on that. Does, does it he used the same transmitter to transmit both. I don't know whether he did. In fact, Definti, um, John Hutchison showed what was possible. And in fact, I can tell you, I've got something very, very um, interesting to announce that um, uh, just over a year ago, I agreed with John Hutchison that I would write his uh, um, official biography. And I've been interviewing him last year for that and also uh, that uh, I, I, I will do a Kickstarter to try and raise as much money as possible to do as much testing as possible uh, and that will be also published in the book and we have some really really interesting things that we are going to do um, uh, over and above that if we can get some extension uh, um, uh, you know what they call stretch goals or whatever but uh, he's not going to be with us forever. Uh, he is a treasure of the highest regard. He rediscovered this technology. He took off where uh, Tesla's attempt to rediscover this uh, hit a brick wall. Um, and uh, 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 he deserves all the credit in the world. And uh, whilst he's still with us, I think it's extremely important um, uh, that we get his take on things. Uh, Okay, so um, I just want to end up with one last thing uh, because it's not 20 past and so I, I've probably blown it now anyway. I have to find a way past the police station, which is next door. Um, 
Jesus. All I'm trying to do is share people. <laughs> oh dear. Let me see if I can find this. Right. I'm going to share you a, a story here now, and I'm going to go back to this one. Can I, can I get the... I want, where is it? Okay. Uh, desktop, that window. Okay. Is it that one? Yes. Um, here we back up. We are in Google Maps again. And when I was looking at this a few hours ago, I was very struck by these lines that are going across here. And the reason I was struck was because about five years ago, I had had someone stay with me. And uh, we were just, I just felt I needed to talk to, to him about something that occurred in the first two years of this uh, millennia uh, that you can't talk on, uh, about on YouTube, otherwise you get your YouTube site taken down. Anyway, it turns out that uh, he had a lot of materials from this and uh, the FBI came around and told him uh, to hand them over, otherwise he wasn't going to be taking many more breaths. And then he got talking, he felt comfortable with me to talk about other subjects and he talked about his girlfriend. Uh, and he was from uh, California, but his girlfriend was from Hawaii. And he said that his girlfriend was a, like a, one of the leading um, expert dive instructors in Hawaii. And he, uh, would, ha, what she did was she took uh, so-called the elites to basically places where you, you shouldn't be diving uh, off the northern islands uh, on, in Hawaii. And um, on one of her dives, uh, she saw uh, these craft under the water uh, going around at phenomenal speeds and then just going out of the water or coming back into the water. And she started talking about these things, and um, she was off. And about two years ago, I was hosting another couple, and I think uh, he was, or she was half Swedish, I think, and uh, but she also lived in Hawaii, and he was from mainland um, America as well, and they'd come for some medical treatments. Um, and I was talking about this because I, I said, oh, I know something about Hawaii, uh, which is quite interesting. This guy talked about these flying things going around under the water and out of the water. And uh, so um, uh, she said, oh, my God. And she turned to her husband and said, I told you, I told you. <laughs> um, I've, got, I've got to switch my camera now. Uh, I told you, I told you. He said, I saw them when I was a child, blah, blah, blah. And I saw them, you know, I told you about it like a couple of years ago. I saw it and it was like a blue like thing that came out, out of uh, the ground and moved across the sky at high speed and like this. And so she's really, really excited that, that she had been living with this memory all of her life about these things that she saw in Hawaii and that she had uh, no one else to talk about. And so I got the full Monty on that. So I had two instances over the last sort of five, six years of people sighting, seeing these craft. But the, the former one who was off, this woman, this uh, expert dive instructor, actually saw them moving around underwater and coming in and out of the water. Um, so, so when I was looking at this map here, and you can see the, I, I, I didn't know what these things were under the sea that I'm pointing to here, going past this island. And so I, I kind of zoomed out and then I sort of, I go over here and I thought, oh my God, this is literally like a super highway. It's like a motorway. What is it? And, and maybe I, it, it's just something that I saw today. And I, maybe it's just, there's something innocent, like maybe it's a cable, but I mean, it's a massive cable <laughs> and it's going up here and it's going up here, going past the islands, going through mountains, going up here, going up here, going through that mountain, going around here, it takes a little angle. Go on here. Oh, we've got a little turn there. We go. Oh, there's some cross lines over there. But it's going over here. It's going over here. It's, what's what's this? It's going over here. What are we looking at? What is this? What? It, where is it going? It kind of disappears under some rock there and re reappears a little bit later. Oh, my, my internet connection's a little bit slow here. Uh, 
So I'm working on 4K and it's trying to buffer it. There we go. It's come out of under that mountain. It's going along here, going along here. And I, I thought, I, I thought this, this can't be, it can't be. And so I, start, I started to zoom out at somewhere around this point. So maybe this is going to work. I thought, where's this going? Where's this going? So this is the line. It's coming up here. Goes past Johnston Atoll, continues up here and they go, oh my God, it goes to Hawaii, the Northern Islands. What are the chances? What are the chances of that? So on that note, I will thank you for your time. Wish me luck on creeping back to my house and not getting a three and a half thousand dollar fine. And uh, uh, there you go. If you have any questions, um, I would be very happy to talk about it. If people have a problem with this thread being on the Lena uh, um, site, I'm sorry, uh, but you need to do your homework uh, because uh, you have someone who's claiming fusion technology called Salvatore Pai, who's also claiming room temperature superconductivity and fast ability to move through space, okay? And, and all, all, you know, multi, multi environment moving. And you've also got the uh, Christopher P. Tinsley interview, I think in 1996 between uh, Martin Fleischmann uh, and himself. And uh, he is talking about uh, uh, several things that he was investigating, uh, the uh, behavior of electrons in metals. Uh, uh, and there's this whole talk about anti-gravity and it's the only part in that presentation where there is a gap. Uh, where Martin Fleischmann effectively talks twice with a dot, dot, dot. So it is probably one of the four things that he was investi investigating. And now we know the Salvatore Pi has four different aspects. It's all related. Cold fusion is the same thing that did this. It's the same thing that built Nan Madal and probably all of megalithic structures. And it's much, much simpler than they would have you believe. So with that, thank you very, very much uh, for your time. And I will see you in the next video.